Hello, my name is Corey Malcolm and I'm the Director of Archaeology at the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West, Florida. The presentation you're about to see tells of how, through detailed archaeological research, the story of the 1564 galleon Santa Clara was revealed. The long lost ship was owned by Pedro Menendez de Aviles, the famed Spanish mariner who is best remembered for establishing the first enduring European colony in North America at St. Augustine, Florida. Though Menendez was not with Santa Clara when it sank, the shipwreck does tell us of the world in which he operated. And, of course, it illustrates details of Spain's maritime system as the nation's ships transitioned from vehicles of conquest to commerce. For many years, the shipwreck was called the St. John's Bahamas Wreck, and that's because it was first discovered by a shipwreck salvage company called St. John's Expeditions. In a unique arrangement, St. John's turned their discovery over to our organization so it could be the subject of a holy archaeological study, with the artifact collection to remain intact forever. I want to say thanks to the men of St. John's Expeditions, Mr. John Browning, Mr. Clarence Whitey Keevan, the late Gene Evans, and the late Richard McAllister. Because of their foresight and their generosity, the St. John's wreck, Santa Clara, will be a shipwreck that future generations can always study and learn from. And as we explore the details of all the research that went into reawakening this ancient shipwreck, I think you'll see that it was one of our museum's finest efforts, too. So, let's get going. Enjoy the show. I think you're going to find it more than interesting. The title of this talk is Solving a Sunken Mystery, and that is indeed what it's about. How, through the detailed archaeological examination of an unidentified shipwreck, cross-connected with historical research, we were able to determine a name and a date for the ship. This presentation will go through various steps of the investigation, and I think in the bigger picture, this project provides a good case study for understanding the techniques and logic behind historical maritime archaeology. Our story starts at the Red X, and in 1991, St. John's Expeditions, a private shipwreck salvage company, discovered a shipwreck along the western edge of the Little Bahama Bank they had leased an area there from the Bahamian government for the right to search for sunken shipwrecks. They were conducting a magnetometer survey throughout the area, and they came across a very large anomaly. A hole was excavated at the magnetic disturbance to see what was causing it, and at the bottom, was revealed a pile of wrought iron artillery. Other artifacts uh, were mixed in there, uh, an iron helmet, uh, earthenware olive jar, other ceramics, uh, everything covered by stone ballast. Uh, a, a certainly an interesting and pretty wide ranging uh, collection of materials. I was called and visited the site in June of 1991. Um, other historians, other archaeologists visited as well. Uh, everybody came to the same conclusion that this wreck was certainly an early Spanish shipwreck, uh, likely 1500s, uh, even though it was unidentified. The question then became, what, what happens to this site? Uh, St. John certainly had uh, the right and the ability to uh, 
salvage the wreck, recover everything for their own purposes. Um, our organization, the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum, put forward a proposal that uh, we would do the excavation, the research, the conservation uh, on the condition that everything uh, stay together as a group, the, the collection, all the recovered materials, and uh, that collection then reside uh, both in Key West and the Bahamas. The men of St. John's uh, agreed to that, and uh, once the Bahamians uh, agreed to it as well, uh, we began to move forward with what became a very, very uh, interesting and successful project. Over the next eight years, field work was conducted to answer the following questions and slowly reveal the story of the ship. Uh, these were uh, sort of basic questions that we were asking of the ship, um, but they kept us focused and on a uh, consistent uh, course. So some of the things we were asking, uh, you know, when, when did the ship wreck? Where did it come from? What, was it doing? What was its purpose? Uh, what type and size was the ship? How was it built? How was it loaded? Uh, what technologies are we seeing on this ship? Uh, and what do they represent? Can it be tied into the written historical record? Can, ID, can it be identified? Um, what European materials do we see being used to sort of conquer, if you will, the new world and vice versa? How is the New World influencing this European ship? What was the extent of any previous salvage, both ancient and modern? And how did the vessel wreck? How did it wind up where it was? So with those uh, questions, um, our field work had a, a, a consistent purpose. And I think we've answered just about every one of them uh, through, through the years. Now, if you swam up on us as the excavation was underway, uh, this is what you would have seen. The wreck is in 15 feet of water, very shallow, um, and it's buried under three to five feet of sand. So uh, it took uh, considerable excavation to actually get to the wreck. All of the digging on the site was done with two four inch diameter water fed Venturi dredges. Um, they basically work like underwater vacuum cleaners and uh, the suction end was uh, operated at the, uh, where the diver was. And then the hose was uh, roughly 15 feet long and discharged uh, sand and coral rubble uh, far away from where the excavation was taking place. Once we had removed all of the uh, overburden from the top of the wreck and the upper surface of the site was revealed, we divided it then into one square meter units. The wreck was then taken apart one square meter at a time. And uh, within each unit, uh, everything from the ship was mapped. Every piece of pottery, every spike, uh, every weapon, no matter large or small, uh, was mapped into scale. Here you can see a broader view of that documentation process in action. All of the artifacts within each unit were drawn to scale and tagged. All of the information for each square meter was recorded onto underwater uniforms and uh, included, uh, you know, who the divers were, the name of the unit, the date that it happened, uh, scale drawings of the objects, tag numbers, descriptions, uh, very comprehensive uh, 
accounting for each square meter. Across the site, through the span of the field work, 255 one meter units were completed. Here you see uh, each unit, uh, its position, as well as a color code for the year in which they were excavated. A considerable amount of wooden hull structure was uncovered as well, uh, mostly uh, planks and degraded frames. These wooden components were very, very fragile, abraded, waterlogged. Uh, they really could not be moved. Uh, so uh, they were documented uh, separately from the uh, one meter units and the entire face that was uh, exposed to us uh, was documented in detail. The wooden remains of the ship were measured and drawn in detail, uh, the dimensions of the various components and uh, all of the fastener patterns. And because these uh, hull remains had been quite flattened over time, uh, it allowed us to even trace them at one-to-one -one scale by laying clear plastic sheeting over them and uh, sketching each plank each framing component with a grease pencil. Here's a short video sequence that uh, shows all of these various activities uh, as they were happening. Dredging. Drawing artifacts within a one meter unit. And here you see the moment an olive jar rim was discovered. Once the field work was completed and all of the notes and measurements and drawings were pulled together into a site plan, we could see that the wreck was just a little uh, over 100 feet long, uh, was exceptionally well preserved, and represented most of the starboard half of the ship, bow trending northward, uh, rigging and artifacts scattered eastward and the keel towards the west. Of course, during the excavation, many artifacts were encountered and removed. And here you see a large wrought iron cannon being carried off the site. At the end of each excavation season, these artifacts were brought up onto the workboat, and then carried as quickly as possible to the laboratory. Artifacts recovered from a marine environment uh, after having been submerged for centuries under the sea uh, have been changed considerably. They're, they have uh, been changed physically, they look different, uh, but they've also been changed uh, chemically as well and they need to be treated in the conservation laboratory where the effects of that long submersion can be reversed and the objects stabilized so that they can be uh, displayed in the air again and uh, that takes a lot of work a tremendous amount of work and all the different material types that uh, uh, are found uh, whether that be iron objects, ceramic pieces, uh, wood, glass, uh, copper, lead, uh, all these different material types take different treatments. It's a very, very complicated uh, subject and we're not going to get into it here, uh, but let it suffice to say that uh, 
the laboratory phase, the conservation phase of uh, an archaeological shipwreck excavation uh, where the uh, objects are, are uh, cleaned, conserved, stabilized, can take years, uh, decades even. And uh, it's got to be done, though, because if it's not, uh, there's really no point in bringing the pieces up. Once the St. John's Rack artifacts were conserved, they were examined, studied, and their nature and functions understood and their places in history determined. It's largely through these objects that we will learn when, where, and how the people on the ship lived their lives and how they conducted their affairs. We can see from this collection that the ship was well defended with many different types of weapons on board. The largest of these armaments are three wrought iron tube guns known generically as bombardettas. The longest of these is over 11 feet and the shortest right around six feet. Associated with these were wrought iron breech chambers that held the gunpowder charges. Dozens of iron, stone, and lead shot for these guns were found too, with each type of shot seemingly linked to a particular gun. These unusual guns were built much like a barrel with iron bar staves bound as a cylinder by a series of hoops and bands. The tubes were mounted on wooden carriages and the breech chamber that held the gunpowder was wedged tightly against the butt end of the tube. When the charge was ignited, the explosive force sent the ball down the tube and towards the enemy. These early guns were used from around the middle of the 14th century up to around 1575 or so. A type of smaller rail-mounted gun was also found. Eight of these wrought iron versos, as they're called, were uncovered, along with breech chambers, wedges, and iron and lead shot. Much like the Bombardettas, versos utilized a removable breech charge. These guns mounted on a pivoting yoke and they could be aimed up and down or side to side. And with eight of these mounted along the ship's rails, it would have been difficult for any enemy to climb aboard. Wrought iron versos were essentially obsolete by 1575. Two rapier swords were found here you see the blade of one coming out from under a plank. Once these rapiers were conserved, it was found they had hilt and pommel design styles that date from the mid to late 1500s. One of the blades bore the inscriptions Andres and Garcia, the name of a mid 16th century Toledo swordsmith. A number of crossbows were found in a relatively small area of the site, indicating that they were likely stored together in a locker or chest of some sort. The wooden stocks of the crossbows deteriorated during their long time underwater. Only the bows and other durable components of the devices survived. Nine steel bows along with firing mechanisms, triggers, goat's foot style cocking mechanisms and iron bolt points show us that the St. John's bows look much like those seen in this 1498 painting. Crossbows fell out of favor as a weapon of war 
in the last quarter of the 1500s. At least eight arquebuses were on the ship, as were hundreds of associated lead round shot and two handheld shot molds. These shoulder mounted matchlock firearms were the precursor to the larger musket, which came into use around 1570. Six iron bills, a type of pole arm designed for stabbing and cutting, would have been used on the ship to repel boarders or in hand to hand combat. There was armor on the ship. At least two iron helmets and multiple breastplate fragments were found. The helmets are of a style that was most popular in the mid to late 1500s. Light armor like this protected the wearer but allowed for much needed mobility in the crowded conditions of a ship. Of course, there are many other types of artifacts on the St. John's ship beyond weaponry, including ceramics. Here are the remains of a broken olive jar. Thousands of fragments of olive jars were found on the St. John's wreck, but luckily there was one intact example to show us what these pieces once were. These earthenware amphoras were used by the Spanish to transport wine, oil, vinegar, and foodstuffs. The necks and rims of 120 jars were found on the site, and they're all of early to mid 16th century styles. The dark object at the center left of this image is a tin glazed myolica plate. There are two forms of plates seen on the St. John's ship the early Moorish style Columbia plain type and the more modern looking brimmed whiteware. These styles would not be expected to be found together until the mid 1500s. Many, many other ceramic types are present. Other Myolica forms, early lead glaze mulatto, Native American or African influence types, and pottery of Portuguese and Italian manufacture, a wide-ranging collection that reflects Spain's sphere of influence in the 16th century. An unusual and fascinating aside to the ceramics is found in a group of earthenware blobs made of the same paste as the olive jars. These blobs were impressed, and when the impressions were cast, fingertips were revealed. Entire fingertips. It isn't clear how or why these are, are there, but this is perhaps the only instance of the fleshy remains of people to be recovered from an ancient shipwreck site. There hasn't been much treasure found on the site, just a few coins and nuggets of silver, but this small collection has proved to be very important. The silver nuggets have proved to be a type of silver called plata corriente, a type of de facto currency produced in colonial mining regions when there was no ready access to mints. On analysis, the silver was found to have come from the mines at Potosi, high in the Andes Mountains of Spanish Peru. The first mint opened in Peru in 1568. The coins we can see uh, from the markings, even though they're just fragments of coins, we see clearly from the markings that they were manufactured in Mexico, Mexico City in the 16th century. Fortunately, uh, the markings that 
will help us uh, the most, the assayer's marks survived. And we see on one example, the mark of assayer O, and on the other, the mark of assayer L. And to have these two coins together, uh, because we know when these uh, uh, assayers operated, to have these two coins together was not possible until after 1554. That then gives us a bottom date for our shipwreck. Throughout the excavation, we were sensitive to the fact that people might have died at the site and that their remains might be found. Bones were uncovered, but upon analysis, none proved to be human. Instead, they were animal bones, cow bones, and pig's teeth, the remains of livestock or salted meat. And other foodstuffs were found too, in the form of small organic remains, hazelnut shells, grape seeds, and olive pits, along with the bones. These provide a glimpse into the shipboard diet. Pests made a home on the ship, almost certainly infesting the food and annoying the passengers. Beetle remains from two unidentified species were found, as was a fragment of the egg casing from an American cockroach. Another small bone found on the shipwreck was initially thought to be from a chicken, but analysis by zooarchaeologists at the University of Florida gave a surprising identification. They determined it was the femur from a very young caiman. Caimans are crocodile-like creatures that reside in South America, and it would seem the one on the St. John's ship was not there to be eaten, but rather as a pet or a zoological souvenir. Many miscellaneous items were on the ship, trade goods like cloth seals and horseshoes, grooming and sewing implements, a fish spear, locks and keys, hand tools, as well as things like lamps and medical equipment. All of these things reflect business activity or would have kept people happy and healthy and comfortable as they move forward through their days at sea. There was a lot of speculation that the St. John's ship was from the earliest days of Spanish exploration of the New World. And the, especially in the early uh, part of the project, the press was uh, ready to run with this story. But as more work was done on the site and the more thoroughly the artifacts were examined, a different story began to emerge. As a whole, the objects were clearly more consistent with a mid to late 1500 state, particularly a 1555 to 1575 time frame. So what was the archaeology saying about the ship in general? Well, the ship was Spanish. There's no doubt about that. There are Spanish ceramics, uh, Spanish names on objects, Spanish uh, coins, uh, very obviously a Spanish ship. The vessel was sizable. When we look at the, uh, the measurements of the uh, the hull remains, we see that it ranged somewhere between uh, 250 and 400 tons. The ship, according to the artifacts, most likely sank sometime between 1555 and 1575. The ship was very well armed, uh, artillery, lots of handheld weapons uh, of all different types. and carried objects from the Americas. Uh, we have uh, American silver, uh, American animals, uh, all, all indicating that this ship had likely made contact in the New World, particularly South America, and was likely then traveling towards Spain. 
the wreck was very well preserved, not scattered. It was in a very uh, contained area, and uh, the site that uh, was examined was uh, quite intact, and, and artifacts in much their original context. There was no evidence that people died. Um, we didn't find bones, we didn't find teeth, but also we didn't find things like uh, jewelry or uh, buttons from clothing or buckles, uh, really nothing to indicate that uh, uh, people perished at the site. And there was no substantial treasure found. Uh, small number of coins, very small number of coins and some plata corriente, but no cargo of treasure. So how did all of this uh, material information then compare to the historical record? A survey of records in Spain shows that many ships wrecked in the general Florida Bahamas area uh, in the mid 1500s and, uh, but a closer look at a lot of these ships uh, showed that some were simply too early. Uh, they couldn't have matched the artifact profile uh, of the St. John ship, and some were too late uh, for the same reasons. Uh, some had bronze cannons. Some were clearly lost on the Florida coast. Some were swamped in very deep water. Um, others had large losses of life. Really, uh, at the end of it all, there was one ship that matched everything that was known about the St. John's wreck, and that was a ship called Santa Clara, a 300-ton vessel sunk in 1564, uh, had sailed to Tierra Firme, the Caribbean coast of South America, and was lost at a place called variously Mime, Mimbre, or Mimere. Well, surveys then of Spanish maps, charts, and sailing accounts made it clear that this uh, location, uh, Mime, Mimbres, Mimeres, referred to the western edges of the Bahama Banks. And uh, uh, very clearly, the areas around uh, Bimini and, and the western edges uh, of Grand Bahama. Here you see a, a Spanish chart from 1600, and it very clearly shows Mimeres uh, right along the western edge of Grand Bahama. And of course, that is exactly where the St. John's wreck was found. There were thousands of pages of government records, correspondence, lawsuits that told the story of Santa Clara and the fleet with which it sailed. And the more these documents were examined, transcribed, translated, the more closely the historical record and the archeological record began to merge and it was really a fascinating process to go through uh, all of these written words and see the story of the shipwreck come into focus. Santa Clara was owned by this man, Pedro Menendez de Aviles. Menendez was a trusted advisor to King Philip II. He was a larger than life figure in Spain's maritime system. He had made many transatlantic crossings. Menendez is perhaps most famous though for being the successful colonizer of Florida and having established the city of St. Augustine, the oldest continuously occupied European city in North America. In June of 1563, Menendez was asked by King Philip to organize a fleet for Tierra Firme. 
Philip wanted the fleet to leave in September. Menendez agreed to do so, and he said that he could use his three ships, San Palayo, Santa Clara, and Magdalena. Shortly after having agreed to organize the fleet, Menendez was jailed by Seville's House of Trade on trumped-up smuggling charges stemming from an earlier transatlantic voyage. Preparations for the fleet continued, though, and Menendez was released periodically from confinement to help get the ships in order. But ultimately, because of his legal issues, he did not sail with them. Instead, Menendez put his right-hand man, Esteban de las Salas, in command of the three ships. The main purpose of the fleet was to carry Lope Garcia de Castro, the newly appointed Viceroy of Peru, to carry him to South America. The ships struggled in their preparations and eventually the fleet left, but over a month late. And not long after they left Spain for the New World, they encountered horrifically stormy weather. The ships were battered and beaten and uh, nearly sank, but they managed to fight their way back to Spain. And there they underwent months of repairs. The fleet was able to leave again this time in April of 1564. And aside from the Viceroy Castro and his entourage, there was a diverse group of passengers. A sampling shows aging conquistadors, descendants of Incan nobility, businessmen, and government officials, all making the crossing to the Americas for a variety of purposes. One surprising discovery was that the ships carried African slaves, not as a cargo, but as personal property, including here uh, four people belonging to the Inca nobleman Francisco Inga Arabalipa, the oldest son of the vanquished Inca emperor Atahualpa. The fleet crossed the Atlantic successfully, and in early May, they landed first at the island of Dominica. There, they tried to get water from the island, but were repelled by the natives who lived there. Uh, they simply would not allow the Spanish to land on their island. So the fleet carried on. They went first to Santa Marta in Colombia and then sailed on to Cartagena. There again to conduct official business and trade with the colonists there. From Cartagena, the three ships sailed to Nombre de Dios in Panama. There, the Viceroy Castro and all of his people got off the ships. They crossed Panama overland, went to the Pacific side, got on other ships, sailed to Lima, and he served as interim viceroy of Peru for five years. After the ships conducted more trade in Nombre de Dios, they took on a cargo of Peruvian silver bars, plata corriente, and gold. Many passengers also came on board the three ships for the return voyage. And as a group, uh, these people represent sort of a later phase of conquest society, if you will. Notably, second tier conquistadors of less bountiful lands and the Peru-based descendants of first phase conquistadors. Shortly after the ships left Panama, the Magdalena was damaged, began taking on water, and had to return to port for repairs. Santa Clara and San Palayo sailed on, and they returned to Cartagena to pick up supplies and other passengers. On September 20th, 
They left Cartagena and started their way back towards Spain. The two ships tried to stop in Havana first, but the seas were too rough to enter the harbor. Instead, they sailed into the Bahama Channel to ride the Gulf Stream current back towards Europe. On October 6th of 1564, Santa Clara ran aground and was abandoned at Mimeris. What happened? How did these events unfold? Well, the two ships were sailing between Florida and the Bahamas, and in the dark of night, the wind and the currents carried them to the east side of the Bahama Channel and over the reefs of the Bahamas. And at three o'clock in the morning, Santa Clara simply sailed up onto a reef and got stuck. The ship was fine. It wasn't leaking. Nobody was hurt. They simply couldn't move. San Palio didn't realize what had happened and kept sailing. So the people on Santa Clara, they lit a lantern and they fired a cannon to signal San Palio. The people on San Palio got that message and they turned the ship around and anchored near Santa Clara. At dawn, they inspected the grounded ship, found it seaworthy, and prepared to tow it off the reef. They quickly realized, though, that to do this would require bringing San Palio over the same reef and into the same danger. This was too great a risk to take, and everybody decided that it was simply best to abandon Santa Clara. And that's what happened. San Palio was anchored in deeper water, and then, using the two ship's boats, the day was spent rowing all the people off Santa Clara and all the treasure off Santa Clara and on to San Palio. Once that was done, everyone said goodbye to Santa Clara, and to quote the documents, all of its artillery, munitions, and equipment. San Palio then continued its voyage northward. A few weeks later, overcrowded San Palio arrived at Tercera and took on supplies. They continued and on December 5th, the ship arrived safely in Cadiz Harbor. Everyone survived and all the treasure was delivered safely. Esteban de las Salas told King Philip and Pedro Menendez the news of Santa Clara's loss. Menendez was understandably upset, but his ire was short-lived. With his legal troubles now fading behind him, Menendez had begun working with King Philip toward something bigger, a plan to counter French intrusion into Florida. And in March of 1565, Menendez was formally granted permission to go there and keep mainland North America under Spanish control. In June of 1565, nine months after Santa Clara was lost, Menendez, on board San Palio, headed across the Atlantic Ocean to establish the first enduring European North American colony at St. Augustine, Florida. The wreck of Santa Clara reflects little known aspects of Menendez's story from just before this history changing venture, and it shows much of the material culture used in his world at that time. In a broader sense, Santa Clara operated in a colonial system transitioning from conquest to the commercialization of the Americas. In the case of its final voyage, conquistadors might have been on board, but only as passengers on a ship carrying them along with trade goods and treasure for a fee, all while following well-established sea routes. Ultimately, by looking at Santa Clara, we can see how ships in the early Spanish transatlantic system functioned as vehicles of social, economic, technological, and biological exchange, and in this way served to forever link the Americas with the rest of the world.
Thank you, and I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. If you're interested in learning more about Santa Clara and exploring some of the resources related to our research into the long lost shipwreck, please see our website, melfisher.org. Thank you.